I thought I had the perfect family, but when I suspected my husband's affair, I became a room attendant to Carrie, so what I saw broke my heart. My husband and my best friend had an affair. I pretended to be a room attendant to catch them. My life, as I knew it, was unremarkably happy, a sentiment that, though plain, encapsulated all I held dear. I had managed to build a family, one that, against odds and through challenges, felt both complete and complex in its everyday normalcy. My husband James, a charming and spirited man of 39, stood at the center of my universe. Our journey together hadn't been straightforward or easy. He had come into our marriage with baggage. A son from his previous marriage and a past tangled with unresolved issues that led to his divorce. His ex-wife had struggled with personal demons, leaving James James to shield their saws from the fallout. So when James and I married seven years ago, I welcomed both into my life with open arms, embracing Lucas as my own. Now nine, Lucas had grown into a thoughtful, quiet boy whose moments of laughter were both rare and precious. Lucas lived with us full time, his presence a constant reminder of the life James had before me, and a life I had willingly stepped into. I treated Lucas with all the affection and care I would my own flesh and blood, and in many ways, he was just that to me. Our bond was strong, despite the initial adjustment and the invisible lines that blended and blurred over time. Then, three years after marrying James, we welcomed another boy into our world, Ethan. Ethan, with his father's eyes and an infectious smile, was a living testament to the happiness and love James and I shared. At five years old, Ethan was the light of our household, often pulling Lucas into his childish games which Lucas indulged with a patience that was beyond his years. Our life in a cozy, suburban neighborhood was filled with the typical hustle and bustle of family activities, school events, weekend soccer games, and family dinners that were noisy with chatter and laughter. James, with his job that often put him in the public eye locally, was a well-known figure in our community. This visibility never seemed to affect our quiet home life. Instead, it filled it with a sense of pride, that we laughed more than we argued, a balance that I had come to cherish deeply. My best friend Claire had been by my side since our college days. She was married to a wealthy businessman who, while providing a life of luxury, failed to meet her deeper needs, especially in their bedroom. Claire often confided in me about her marital frustrations. Her voice a mixture of envy and despair when she compared her emotional and sexual dissatisfaction with the vibrancy she saw in my marriage. She was always there, a fixture in my life, sharing everything with me as I did with her. Despite her personal discontent, Claire's frequent visits and our daily conversations never hinted at anything. She was anti-Claire to my boys, a role she relished despite her own lack of desire for children. Her presence was a comfort and echo of a past that both of us shared and held onto through our transitioning lives. Our families intertwined not out of necessity but choice. Claire and her husband, often joining us for barbecues and birthday parties, seemed just another branch of our extended family tree. These gatherings, filled with laughter and casual joy, painted a picture of harmony. James had always been a loving and attentive husband. His expressions of affection were frequent and heartfelt, whether it was a surprise bouquet of flowers or a simple note left on the fridge saying how much he loved me. So but slowly I began to notice shifts in his behavior that, at the time, seemed insignificant but now scream with meaning. There were the evenings when James would come home from work, his face drawn, not with the usual fatigue of a long day, but with a pensiveness that seemed to cloud his eyes. So when I asked if everything was all right, he would flash me a brief tight smile and assure me everything was fine, attributing his mood to an especially challenging day. His eyes, once so quick to meet mine, now often diverted away, as if holding my gaze was too much to bear. So then there were the text messages. I remember one night, lying beside him as he typed away on his phone. I glanced over curious about who he was texting so late. He quickly angled the screen away and said it was just a work email he had to respond to urgently. His expression was too calm, practiced, and it prickled my senses with unease. But I pushed those feelings away, chastising myself for being overly suspicious. With Claire, the changes were even more pronounced, though cloaked in subtleties that only in retrospect reveal their true weight. She had always been open and vibrant, sharing every detail of her life with an almost brutal honesty. So but as the months passed, her vivacity dimmed. She became more reserved, her laughter less frequent, and her visit shorter. When she did come over, her smile didn't quite reach her eyes, and there was a hesitation in her actions, as if she were constantly on the verge of saying something more, but thought better of it. I remember one particular afternoon when Claire and I had met for lunch. She seemed unusually distracted, her eyes flicking to her phone every few minutes. I had jokingly asked if she had a secret lover she was keeping from me. She had laughed it off, but there was a flash of something in her expression, a flicker of guilt, perhaps, that made me pause. So but then she quickly changed the subject, gushing about a new restaurant she wanted us to try, and the moment passed. Our conversations, once filled with earnest depth, had taken on a superficial quality. She asked about my life, my family, but it was as if she was going through the motions. I shared stories of James and the kids, unaware that each word might be a sting to her conscience. Looking back, I can almost pinpoint the exact moments when her discomfort was most palpable, especially when I talked about James with affection and pride. The one evening, the four of us, James, Claire, her husband, and I, had dinner at our place. 
I noticed how Claire's laughter seemed foresaid, how she and James accidentally exchanged looks that they both quickly smothered. It was as if they were both in a play, each performing their part but with a falter here and there that only a discerning eye would catch. After they left that night, the air felt charged, heavy with unspoken words and unasked questions. James was unusually quiet, retreating into a shell that I couldn't seem to penetrate. When I asked if he was okay, he brushed it off, mumbling something about being tired. But his eyes avoided mine, and there was a tension in his jaw that hadn't been there earlier. These signs, these tiny cracks in the facade of our daily lives were there, forming a pattern I only now fully see. The pain of realizing that not only was my husband unfaithful, but that my best friend was his accomplice, cuts deeper than anything I've ever felt. It shakes the very foundation of what I believed my life to be, leaving me to wonder how I missed the signs when they were so clearly there, painting a picture of betrayal right before my eyes. For the day I discovered the devastating truth about my husband and my best friend Claire, started like any other. It was a sunny Tuesday, and I was busy organizing the house while Ethan played in the living room. My phone buzzed with the arrival of a message. Expecting it to be a reminder or a message from a family member, I checked it casually, but what I saw was neither. It was an anonymous text, simply stating a hotel name and room number. The sender was unknown, and my heart sank with a dreadful premonition. Confusion and fear mingled with a sharp sting of betrayal as I read and reread the message. So why would someone send me this? Was it a mistake, or was it something more sinister? Despite every rational part of me screaming to dismiss it, the seed of doubt had been planted. I needed to know the truth. I arranged for my neighbor to watch Ethan, giving some vague excuse about an unexpected errand. My hands shook as I drove to the hotel, the address burning in my with every mile that passed. As I parked the car, my breaths were short, each one heavier than the last. I walked to the room, my legs feeling like they could give out at any moment. Standing outside the door, I hesitated. The fear of what I might find on the other side gripped me, but I had to know. I mustered all the courage I had left and knocked softly. Come in, why are you taking so long? Help me clean up my spilled wine, a familiar voice called from inside. It was Claire's voice, casual and irritated. My heart pounded against my chest as I pushed the door open, feigning the role of a hotel employee. The scene before me was like a still from a nightmare. My husband, James, was out on the balcony, his back to the room, seemingly caught up in a phone call. Claire was sprawled on the bed, a glass of wine tipped over on the bedside table, its contents staining the crisp white sheets. I bent down, pretending to clean up, my hands trembling as I grasped the cloth. Claire continued to talk, unaware of who I really was. You know, he's the only one who can satisfy me, she said, a moan of contentment lacing her voice as she referred to my husband. I've always been so jealous of her, living such a perfect life, she added bitterly. I froze, the cloth in my hand forgotten. Her words echoed in the room, each syllable slicing through me like a blade. She spoke of her husband then, deriding him as physically weak and inadequate. The casual cruelty of her words, the ease with which she dismissed her vows, shook me to my core. I stood my disguise as a cleaner forgotten as I faced the reality of their betrayal. Though my presence still unnoticed, I watched as James turned from the balcony, his face lighting up as he saw Claire. So the affection in his eyes was unmistakable, and it was not directed at me. Feeling nauseous, I backed away, the room spinning around me. I managed to stumble out before they saw me, my heart breaking with each step. Outside, the cool air hit my face, but it did nothing to ease the heat of my shame, anger, and sorrow. I vomited in the bushes outside the hotel, the physical purging a pathetic echo of the emotional turmoil inside. The drive home was a blur. My mind replayed the scene over and over, each detail a torment. How long had this been going on? How could they do this to me, to us, to our family? The questions spiraled, each one unanswered, each one a further descent into despair. I arrived home to the sound of Ethan laughing as he played. The normalcy of the scene was a stark contrast to the chaos within me. How could I reconcile the world I thought I knew with the deceit I had just witnessed? That night, after Ethan was in bed, I sat alone in the darkness of the living room, waiting for James to come home. Though the waiting was excruciating, each minute stretching out endlessly. When he finally arrived, his smile faltered at the sight of me, my red-rimmed eyes and pale face undoubtedly telling more than I could say with words. Is everything all right? He asked, a note of concern in his voice that now sounded hollow. How could I begin to confront him? How could I explain the agony his actions had caused? The room felt suffocating as I struggled to find the words. The anonymous message from the morning to get me. A puzzle piece that didn't fit, its origin still a mystery that I needed to solve. So my mind wouldn't allow me to rest, not yet. So I slipped out of the bedroom quietly, careful not to disturb James, and made my way to the living room. The house was silent, shadows playing along the walls as the streetlights cast dim glows through the windows. Sitting on the sofa, I pulled out my phone and dialed the anonymous number once more, my heart racing with a mix of dread and determination. The phone rang, cutting through the quiet darkness of the room. It rang longer than I expected, each tone echoing my escalating tension. Then, surprisingly, there was an answer. The voice on the other end was immediately recognizable, though I had never expected to hear it in this context. So it was Claire's husband, Mark. Why did you send me that message? I asked, my voice a mix of confusion and anger. There was a pause on the line, a hesitation that spoke volumes before Mark even uttered a word. So when he finally spoke, his voice was low, tinged with a bitterness that I hadn't heard before. I thought it was time you knew the truth, he said simply. Yet the weight of his words felt heavy and complex. When did you find out? 
I pressed on, needing to understand why he, of all people, would be the one to inform me. I've had my suspicions for a while, Mark confessed, his tone resigned. I confirmed it a few days ago, I saw them together, much like you did today. The revelation stung. It wasn't just the betrayal, it was the casualness of their deceit, how it seemed to unravel so easily to those looking closely enough. Why tell me this way? Why not confront Claire or even James? I asked, my voice cracking with the strain of the day's emotions. Mark sighed, a sound of deep weariness traveling through the line. Because Claire has never been honest with me, not really. I knew she married me for my money, but I thought, maybe there was something more, eventually. I wanted to hurt her the way she hurt me, by ripping apart the facade she's been living with you, with everyone. His words revealed a pain and a vindictiveness that made me shudder. It was a retaliation meant to wound deeply, indiscriminately. But did you think about how this would affect me? My family, I asked, my voice barely above a whisper, my grip tightening around the phone. I did, he admitted, and his voice softened slightly. And I'm sorry for the collateral damage. I didn't want to hurt you or your kids. You deserve better than this, all of you do. I just, I couldn't see any other way to make her feel the consequences of her actions. The conversation drifted into an awkward silence, both of us lost in our own turmoil. Here was a man broken by betrayal, lashing out in his pain, and here was I, a casualty of his revenge. It was too much to take in, too cruel and tangled to fully comprehend in the shadow of my own heartbreak. Is that supposed to make me feel better? I finally said, not expecting an answer, not really wanting one either. No, I guess not, Mark responded, his voice a mix of resignation and sorrow. But maybe, in time, we can both find some peace, knowing the truth. Maybe we can rebuild something from the ruins, even if it's not what we had before. The line went dead then, and I was left with the echoes of our conversation. The night stretched on, endless and heavy. So Mark's motives, though fueled by his own pain, had thrust me unwillingly into the role of Avenger in his marital drama, exposing wounds in my life that might never fully heal. So I sat there for a long time, the phone still in my hand, staring into the darkness. The truth was out, a bitter pill that offered no real comfort, only more questions and the daunting task of navigating what was left of my marriage and my friendship. As dawn began to break, the first light casting a pale glow into the room, I knew that the path ahead was uncertain. Forgiveness seemed as distant as the fading stars, and trust, once broken, loomed as a colossal challenge to rebuild. But in that moment of early morning clarity, I realized that whatever decisions lay ahead, they would start with facing the day and the consequences head on. I woke up from an uneasy slumber, a night marred by turmoil and haunted by the echoes of betrayal. The weight of discovery Discovery sat heavy on my chest, making it hard to breathe, hard to think. Despite the unrest, I had made a decision the previous night. I needed to talk to James, face to face, to resolve this excruciating mess we found ourselves in. I wanted answers, needed closure, or at least the beginning of a conversation about where we stood. So my plan was to meet him tonight, after the kids were asleep, a time we could talk undisturbed. With this resolve, I reached for my phone to text him, a simple message to confirm our talk. But as the screen lit up, I was met not with the quiet icons of my home screen, but with notifications flooding in. A storm of alerts and messages that immediately set my nerves on edge. Curiosity mixed with dread. I opened the social media app to find the source of the commotion. There, on my feed, was something so shockingly personal and devastating that it knocked the wind out of me. A video unmistakably featuring James and Claire in a very compromising, intimate scene. It was posted by an anonymous account, but the content was explicit leaving no room for doubt about what it depicted, or who was involved. The reality that our private agony was now public spectacle was paralyzing. I knew immediately it was Mark's doing. His previous actions, the pain in his voice last night, painted a clear picture of a man driven to the edge by heartbreak and betrayal. His method of exposing the affair, so raw and cruel, was the act of someone consumed by revenge, not just intent on reclaiming his dignity, but on destroying everything in his path. As I stared at the screen, numb and disbelieving, my phone began to ring, jolting me from the shock. It was relentless, buzzing again and again, vibrating with an urgency that mirrored the chaos now exploding around me. Journalists, friends, acquaintances, news of this scandal was spreading like wildfire, and everyone wanted a piece of the drama, a comment, a reaction. Oh my god, I murmured to the empty room. Everything was falling apart, unraveling faster than I could have ever anticipated. So the conversation I had planned with James, meant to be a private affair to mend or end what was left of our marriage, was now irrelevant. The world had intruded, cruel and uninvited, into our lives. My heart raced as I tried to process the rapid collapse of my privacy and personal life. This video, this vile breach of our intimate moments, changed everything. There was no room now for quiet discussions or contemplative reconciliations. The issue demanded immediate attention, not just as a personal betrayal, but as a public spectacle that was spiraling out of control. With shaking hands, I dialed James's number. He answered quickly, his voice tense, aware already of the digital wildfire consuming our lives. Have you seen it? Was all I could ask, my voice a mix of anger, sadness, and disbelief. Yes, I've seen it, he replied, his voice heavy with regret and something else. Fear, perhaps. I'm so sorry, this isn't how I wanted. How you wanted what, James? For me to find out. For everything to end, I cut him off, unable to contain the torrent of emotions. It's everywhere. Our friends, family, everyone has seen it. How do we even begin to handle this? There is a pause, heavy and laden with the weight of our crumbling world. I'm coming home. We need to talk face to face. 
We need to figure out what to do about, about everything. The call ended, leaving me in a turmoil of thoughts and emotions. I knew that whatever came next would be incredibly challenging. Facing the public humiliation, dealing with the betrayal, and navigating the fallout with our children and our families, there was no easy path forward. The hours until James's return were agonizing. I sat, enveloped in a haze of anxiety and betrayal, trying to brace myself for the confrontation to come. How do you confront a betrayal that's become a public circus? How do you reclaim any sense of normalcy when your private life has been laid bare for all to see? So when James finally walked through the door that evening, the look on his face told me he was as devastated by the stare as I was by the betrayal. We sat across from each other, the weight of unspoken words heavy between us. This wasn't just about us anymore, it was about our children, our families, and the indelible marks this scandal would leave on all our lives. The conversation that followed was painful but necessary. We discussed immediate steps to protect our privacy, ways to handle the media, and most importantly, how to address this with our children. We talked about the potential for legal action against Mark for the invasion of privacy and the dissemination of the video. Through it all, the need for decisions about the future of our marriage loomed large. But those decisions were for another day. Right now, we needed to manage the crisis at hand, to protect our family from further fallout, and to begin the arduous process of healing, whatever that might look like. After James had come home and we'd begun to tentatively address the fallout from the scandal that was now openly unfolding, I knew there was one more call I needed to make. Despite the raw emotions and the deep sense of betrayal, I needed to contact Mark. The urgency to protect what little remained of our family's privacy propelled me into action. I found a quiet corner in the chaos of our home, my hands trembling as I dialed Mark's number. The phone rang, each tone echoing in the emptiness of the room, magnifying my anxiety. When he finally answered, his voice was cold, distant. Mark, please, I started my voice pleading, you have to take down the video. I think about my sons, think about what this will do to them if they see it. There was a pause on the other end of the line. I could almost hear him weighing his options, his breath a soft but audible intake. I posted that video for a reason. Mark's voice was resolute, tinged with the bitterness that had likely driven him to expose the affair so publicly. I understand your hurt, I continued, fighting to keep my voice steady despite the turmoil inside me. So but my children have nothing to do with this, they are innocent, please, don't let them suffer because of our mistakes. Mark's reply was a sigh, long and weary. You think I want to hurt children, he asked, his tone softening slightly. You think I haven't thought about that? I know you're angry, and you have every right to be, I said, trying to connect with the part of him that had once been our friend before all this bitterness took hold. But please, reconsider what this will do to them. They could lose friends, be bullied. Their whole world could change, and once something is on the it's there forever. There was another silence, longer this time. I held my breath, waiting, hoping that my words had reached him, had reminded him of the man who used to come to our home, who had laughed and dined with us, who wasn't this person consumed by revenge. Finally, he spoke again, his voice less certain than before. I don't want to hurt your kids, I don't, he admitted, and Mightyest's words seemed to carry a weight of realization, as if seeing the broader impact of his actions for the first time. But Claire and James, they did this, not me. They did, and they are dealing with it, I assured him, my voice firm, so that our children shouldn't shaft you. Please, Mark, do this for them. Take the video down. We talked a little more. I told him about Ethan's recent school achievements, how he was just starting to really enjoy his soccer games. I mentioned Lucas's quiet strength, how he had been dealing with so much already between the complexities of his blended family life and normal childhood challenges. So with each word, I hope to humanize the situation to bring it back from the abstract online world to the very real, very affected lives of these two little boys. Then Mark finally conceded, his voice a mixture of defeat and clarity. Okay, he said, I'll take it down, not for James or Claire, but for the kids. I thanked him, relief flooding through me, though tempered by the knowledge of the lingering effects of his initial decision. We ended the call on a note of strained civility, the connection forever altered, but with a sliver of respect for his final choice to protect my children. After hanging up, the relief was palpable, but so was the gravity of what still lay ahead. The video might be taken down, but the damage was done. Rumors had been ignited, conversations started, and the digital footprint, though now less traceable, would never be completely erased. The task of facing our friends, family, and a especially our children with the truth loomed large. How to explain such adult failures to such young minds was a puzzle I was still piecing together. The forthcoming days would require careful navigation, as James and I would need to shield our sons from as much fallout as possible, while also preparing to answer their questions with honesty appropriate for their age. In the wake of the scandal that crumbled the facade of my once seemingly perfect life, the days that followed were some of the most challenging I had ever faced. The very foundation of my existence, my marriage, had been irrevocably altered by betrayal, and the aftermath was a painful navigation through a landscape I hardly recognized. The morning after I successfully Successfully persuaded Mark to take down the incriminating video, James approached me with a solemnity that was uncharacteristic of the man I had known. He held a set of divorce papers in his hands, his eyes avoiding mine as he placed them gently on the kitchen table where we had shared countless family meals and lighthearted conversations. I think it's best if we do this, he said quietly, his voice strained. I don't deserve your forgiveness or your feelings anymore. The finality in his voice cut through the air, sharper than any words he had uttered the night before. I looked at the papers, a cold hard reality settling over me. 
Despite the tumult of emotions, a part of me had clung to the hope of reconciliation, not just for our sake, but for our sons. But in that moment, as I watched James, defeated and resigned, I understood that our path forward needed to be apart. With a heavy heart, I signed the papers, each stroke of my name a silent testament to the years we had shared and the future we would not. I didn't contest much, I just asked for primary custody of our sons, ensuring they would have stability and continuity in their lives as much as possible. James agreed without hesitation, the guilt etching deeper lines into his face. Once everything was settled legally, I took our youngest son, Ethan, and moved to a nearby apartment. It was a modest place, but filled with potential for a new beginning, a space just for us, away from the shadows of past betrayals. And meanwhile, Claire's life unraveled in ways more dramatic and public than I could have imagined. After her affair with James and the subsequent fallout, Mark, driven by a blend of betrayal and vindication, ensured that Claire would not benefit from their divorce. Armed with evidence of her adultery, he barred her from claiming any significant part of his considerable wealth. Last I heard, she was sent away empty-handed, a fitting end to her duplicitous maneuvers. But Claire's descent didn't stop there. Recently, the news broke that she had been arrested for corporate corruption, so it seemed her unethical behaviors were not limited to her personal life but had permeated her professional dealings as well. While part of me felt vindicated that Claire was facing justice, another part of me was saddened by the sheer waste of her potential and the destruction of the person I once considered a close friend. As for my life, it has taken a turn toward rebuilding and refocusing on the future. The divorce, though painful, allowed me to start anew, focusing solely on raising Ethan and ensuring that Lucas, though he lived with James, remained a central part of our lives. The challenge, however, has been dealing dealing with the emotional and psychological impact on Ethan. So the absence of his father in our daily life has been a significant adjustment for him. James tries to be present, coming by to visit and taking Ethan out on weekends. But the once seamless nature of our family life is now a patchwork of scheduled visits and shared custody. Ethan, only five years old, struggles with this new reality. He often asks when daddy is coming home, and on days when he realizes that the home he knew is no more, his confusion turns into quiet sorrow. Seeing my son grapple with these feelings has been heart-wrenching. Despite the anger and betrayal I felt towards James, I've encouraged a healthy relationship between him and Ethan, believing that whatever issues we had as spouses should not taint their father-son bond. So we both agreed to attend family therapy to help Ethan adjust to the changes, and while it has been helpful, the road is undoubtedly long and filled with uncertainties. In this new chapter of our lives, I've had to be both mother and father in many ways, trying to fill the gaps left by James's absence. I've also had to navigate my own healing process, dealing with the lingering feelings of betrayal and the task of forgiving enough to move forward, if not for myself, then for the sake of Ethan. As I focus on rebuilding our lives, my resolve strengthens. I have found solace in returning to work and strengthening bonds with family and friends who have shown unwavering support through these tumultuous times. The community around us has been a steady source of comfort and stability, and I'm grateful for every gesture of kindness and understanding they have extended towards us. Despite the scars left by the events of the past months, I am hopeful. Life, though unpredictable and often painful, also brings opportunities for growth and new beginnings. For Ethan, for Lucas, and for myself, I am committed to building a future defined not by the failures and betrayals of the past, but by the possibilities of what is yet to come. As we move forward, one day at a time, I hold on to the hope that with love, resilience, and a bit of courage, we can find peace and happiness again.